Hey folks, Ariel over here at Finest, where tonight I'm planning to do just a little book review. Um, over the years, I've only discussed books <laughs> in videos I've done a couple times. I think when I did one about composting and the Humanor Handbook, and one about soil testing and the Intelligent Gardener book. But I get a lot of questions from people about how do you learn this or that or the other thing. Um, none of it's because I'm extra brilliant, it's because I learn things from other people who are extra brilliant. And I've been very, very blessed in my life to have um, lots of, you know, people I know in person in the real world share a lot of skills and knowledge with me, and to be blessed to learn from a lot of people who have no idea who I am and may have died long before I was born or things like that through their books um, and in the modern world uh, through podcasts and videos and such. And so um, I just thought I would, every now and then, winter's a good time to sit down beside the fire in the evening. The light will probably continue to drop as this video goes on and talk about some books that I have found really valuable and I think you might enjoy too. Now, some of these, uh, every now and then there'll probably be one that I, and these might not all be books, some might be podcasts or video channels or other things I've found useful, but um, a lot of books I think are, are great used, um, you know, shared through libraries, all that, and then there are some that I think are worth owning physical copies of yourself because they're just something you're going to want to reference over and over, not just read once. This one's probably somewhere in between there. I'm glad I own a copy, but it's more so that I have it, I can reference it when I want to, and I can loan it to other friends, which I've done several times already. It's looking a little warm. This book that I'm talking about tonight is called Gaia's Garden. It's by Toby Hemingway. I'll link down below to where you can find it if it's not at your local library and you don't have a friend you can borrow it from or anything like that. Um, the subtitle is A Guide to Homescale Permaculture. If you're not familiar with permaculture, the general idea is pretty comprehensive look at how we grow things and live. That's a very, very brief summary of a very broad topic. Anyway, I really, really liked Mr. Hemingway's book. And um, there's just tons of valuable info in here. I would say this is a good one. If you are brand new to gardening, brand new to a new property, that you like you've just moved to your own little homestead outside of a city, or anything like this, this would be an excellent book to read. It's um, some books on permaculture can get pretty technical and even a little dry and very lengthy. This is very, very accessible, very down to earth and very practical. And just a lot of things about how you would think about what you want to out of your property, how you're going to lay things out. This isn't just how do I grow a lettuce from this seed. It's it's more of the big, big picture things. And uh, I just wanted to read just a couple excerpts from it because I find this stuff really inspiring. And this is part of, I mean, I enjoyed this book because I was already on this track, but th this uh, sometimes authors express things much more eloquent than I do. Um, anyway, we, people in this country, I believe this is talking in America, uh, live on a, the developed 6% of the land. So people live on about 6% of the land. And we use between 40 and 70% of America's land area, depending how use is defined to support us. Monoculture farms and industrial forests, grazing land and feedlots, reservoirs, strip and open pit mines, military reservations, and all the other accoutrements of modern civilization con consume a huge amount of space, and almost none of it functions as a native or healthy habitat. Each non-homegrown meal, each trip to the lumberyard, pharmacy, clothing store, other shop, commission the conversion of once native habitat into an ecological desert. The lumber for a typical American house of 2,500 square feet scalps roughly three acres of forest. Thus living in a modest house will aid native species vastly more than while installing a few mountain laurels on a small suburban lot. Um, that just gives you a little look at, plus I'm looking behind the camera and there is a spectacular pink sunrise going on in the mountain, or sorry, sunset going on in the mountains out there. Um, that kind of thing is what inspires me to to try to grow everything I can produce here and walk 15 feet or 15 yards or whatever to get my eggs or my lettuce or my carrots or anything like that, where food doesn't have to travel what I believe is the average in this country last I checked about 1,500 miles before it hits your mouth, just makes a 
huge difference. Uh, continuing a little further on. Every bit of food or scrap of lumber, each medicinal herb or any other human product that comes from someone's yard means one less chunk of land outside of your hometown that needs to be denuded of natives and developed for human use. <clears throat> anyway, that's... I can't read you the whole book. That You'd need to buy the audiobook if there is one. I'm not even sure if there is. Um, but that's the kind of thing that inspires me to do a lot of the stuff that we do around here on a day-to-day -day basis. And then there's just all kinds of fascinating details. If you didn't know this kind of stuff about soil, like how much life is in the soil. That's just my bookmark because I didn't want to take forever finding my pages while I was on the camera. How much life is in the soil? At least as much as above ground. When we look at a landscape, the plants and animals on the surface are obvious, but it's not easy to visualize how much life is underneath. Uh, I'm skimming here as I read to you. A teaspoon of good pasture soil may contain about a billion bacteria. This is a teaspoon we're talking. A billion bacteria, a million fungi, and 10,000 amoeba. It's hard to believe that anything else can even fit in that teaspoon, but soil critters are small. There's still plenty of room for the clay, silt, sand, water, air, hummus, humus, and assorted small mo molecules that make up the rest of the soil. Above ground, an acre of good pasture may support a horse or two, say about half a ton of animals. But living in the soil of that acre may be about two tons of worms and, other, and another two tons of bacteria, fungi, and soil animals, such as millipedes and mites. That one horse per acre soil may contain eight or ten horses worth of animals below ground. Vegetarians may be appalled, but much of gardening actually involves raising animals, the tiny ones under the earth's surface. Etc. And I find, as you may have gathered if you've watched any of my gardening videos over the years, learning more and more about soil life and how, how soil works and how plants work and how all that affects us when we eat the things produced by them. Just absolutely fascinating. Um, there's lots of discussion of you know, different ways to lay things out, things to think about. Where's your sun? Where's your wind? Like I said, what do you want out of your property? What are you trying to produce? What kind of climate do you have? Do you have extra water to deal with? Do you have not enough water to deal with? Do you have puppy dogs and chickens? Or, you know, just what is going on in your place? Can you lay down, baby? Come here. Good boy. Um, and then just the fascinating little... Um, Details, if you stop and think, and this is one of the reasons I like to do macro photography, whether it's the delicate ice crystals or the, the leaves and flowers and stuff in the summer, um, you know, just all the things that a tree can do. Uh, the author just picked a tree as one example here because everything is interconnected and works together and affects more than one thing. And again, I'm just going to skim this. Um, you might plant a tree in your backyard to create a shady spot, uh, but even this single tree is doing lots of things. Sunlight hits it, um, the leaves are dry, oh, I, they, sorry, I'm skimming here because I don't want to read all of it, but um, sunlight hits it, most of the energy of those beams is consumed in evaporating dew. Once the leaves are dry, the sunlight warms the air within the tree. Above the tree, however, the air has begun to heat, and there's a cloud of just awakened in insects swirling there. Below the canopy, it's still too chilly for bugs to venture out, so they roil in a normal, a narrow band within the thin layer of warm air above the tree, where birds swoop in to feast on them. In the cool shade, snow remains laid into the spring, long after other has melted. Soil near the tree stays moist, watering both the oak and nearby plantings, and helps to keep a nearby creek flowing. Uh, for instance, early miners in the west, near where I live, frequently reported creeks disappearing once they cut down nearby forests for mine timbers. Um, soon the sun warms the night chilled air within the tree, the entrapped air dries, it's moisture escaping to the sky to help form clouds. Uh, this is replaced by transpire uh, moisture from the leaves, which helps pull water up from the roots and exhales it. Uh, the groundwater is filtered by the tree and exits through the leaves as pure. Trees are excellent water purifiers. A full-grown tree can transpire 2,000 gallons of water on a hot dry day. But this moisture doesn't just go away, it soon returns as rain. Up to half the rainfall over forested land comes from the tree themselves. Um, leaves absorb sunlight and warm the air within the tree. This hot, moist air rises and mixes with cooler, dry air above. Close to the ground, uh, trees block the wind and make excellent wind breaks. Wind streaming past a warm building can carry off a lot of heat, so one or more trees on the house's windward side, windward side will substantially reduce heating bills. Um, Lots and lots of stuff. It's just fascinating. A single tree may have 10 to 30 acres of leaf surface, all able to draw dust and pollutants from the air. Air passing through the tree is thus purified and humidified as well. 
As the air passes through the tree, it picks up moisture exhaled from the leaves, a light burden of pollen grains, a fine mist of small molecules produced by the tree, some bacteria and fungal spores. <clears throat> Uh, later in the day, clouds, half of them created by the tree's ramper, begin to build. Rain droplets readily form around that bacteria, pollen, and other microscopic debris lofted up from the oak. The small particles provide the nucleation sites that raindrops need to form. Thus, trees act as cloud seeders, bringing more rain. As rain falls, the droplets smack against the leaves and spread out on a fine film coating the entire tree, all 10 to 30 acres of leaves, plus the branches and trunk, and before much rain strikes the ground, this thin film begins to evaporate even as the rain falls, further delaying any throughfall. Mosses and lichens on the trees soak up even more of the rain. We've all seen dry patches beneath trees after a rain. A mature tree can absorb over a quarter of an inch of rain before any reaches the ground, even more if the air is dry and the rain is light. Uh, and it just goes on and on and on about what happens in the fog and what happens at night and you know, so you can just get an idea of just how many different things one thing is doing. And there's that kind of content all through this entire book. Um, lots of pictures of the author's own stuff as well as other uh, places they have visited. There's even some cool like before and after pictures. Like this is somebody's uh, place in California and I don't know if the light's good enough in here but on the one side there you can see the you know bare dirt lot they started out with around the house and what a thriving uh, little Garden of Eden they were able to turn it into and I find stuff like that inspiring. Um, there's lots of diagrams and plans for how things work together. Uh, lots of Li charts and lists and stuff in the back of things that worked for different hardiness zones because obviously there's a huge variety of climates. Um, I'm in one of the most extreme <laughs> myself. Uh, references for all kinds of stuff. Uh, a long list of resources from magazines to seed uh, sources um, and so on. Anyway, Gaia's Garden by Tobing Hemingway is a book that I have very much enjoyed. I I think we bought a lot of books for each other because my mother and I actually have similar interests in some of this stuff. I think I bought her a copy of this. I don't think it's one she originally bought me a copy of, but I could be backwards on that. Anyway, I've bought copies for friends. I've loaned this copy to friends, which is why it's looking a little bit dog-eared now. Um, but this is a book, if you have any of these kind of interests or if any of those little tiny snippets I read to you sound interesting, I think you might very much enjoy. And I'll see you guys next time we have a fireside chat about some other resource I have found valuable. Have a great night. Burley says goodbye too. Actually, he says, I want to go outside, Mama. Okay, you can. Hello, over here at Finest. Thank you so much for watching these videos and spending some of your very valuable time choosing to do that. We hope you found something that was useful, educational, helpful, maybe save someone else some time and trouble, or just something just plain beautiful. If you don't want to miss any videos, subscribe and hit the bell. And thanks for coming along on our journey as we build a new little homestead with our tiny house and everything to come.